He gave me a hand to shake my hand, but I needed that hand to get some help to get up here. Um, some things change through the years. How many of you are old enough to, to know what I'm talking about? Some things change through the years, and you hold on to the railing while you're walking up the stairs. If your knees hurt or your ankles hurt, you never pass a bathroom as you get older, and uh, it's just the way that it is. And Yeah. Man, Zach, thank you so much for leading us in worship. I, I just wish you had a little more energy, bro. See, <laughs> that was powerful. That was really powerful. Um, it was. It was 40 years ago, 1981, that uh, I'd been asked to do this um, couples uh, Bible study with a bunch of couples from different churches in Desert Hot Springs. And so we did that. And it was during that time I began to feel like God was uh, nudging us to start a fellowship out there. And through a series of testing it, uh, it became very apparent. And so it was right about this time we started the first a little uh, home fellowship that would become uh, Calvary Chapel of Desert Hot Springs. And one of the first people to come out and visit us was Jack. And uh, came out with uh, Pastor Jeff from Downey. And uh, it was just so nice to see brothers that were willing to visit a church that was about this big at that time. It was just so tiny. And uh, so we've had a great uh, friendship ever since then. And when we were on the mission field, there were... Uh, a good handful of churches that supported us through that whole time, and you were one of those churches, so I want to thank you. And I, I pray that it was worth your investment. I know God did a lot of great things there. But I want to share a song with you at the beginning, and I'll share a song with you at the end that is so tied into that last song that you sang, Zach, about uh, your goodness is running after me. How many of you are thankful that God is still running after you? He's running with you, but how many of you know he's after some things in your life too? Yeah. How many of you have been putting those things before him? Give, it, give him what he's after. Right? Let me just say it. He has a way of getting to it anyway. But I want to share this song with you. Um, um, can I do it up here yeah. with this mic? Okay. Jack, can you come back up and help me up again? <laughs> You're on your own, buddy. Do I have to touch anything down here? This is a... Uh, this song is one of those prayers that in one way or another, I think every lover of Jesus prays it uh, over and over again through the, through the years. And uh, where you're saying, God, take me deeper, take me to a new place. Do a deep work in my heart and go beyond all my defenses I drop my mask oh Lord I ask do a deep work in my heart how many of you with me on that that cry a deep work in my heart go beyond all my defenses I drop my mask oh Lord I ask to a deep work in my heart Second verse sounds kind of like that. And do a deep work in my heart. Take me out beyond the shallows. Take me out beyond the shallows. I drop my cares. I drop my cares. Lord, take me there. Do a deep work in my heart. These are the words of David when he was praying that same prayer in a different way. And I will know joy again. And I will sing songs of gladness again. And I will be clean when the bones you have broken rejoice do 
a deep work in my heart. I'm standing here unguarded. I'm standing here unguarded. I drop these cares. Oh, Lord, take me there to a deep work in my heart. I'm standing here unguarded. I'm standing here unguarded. Take me out beyond the shallows. Take me out beyond the shallows. Go beyond all my defenses. Go beyond all of my defenses. Do a deep work. Do a deep work in my heart. Do a deep work in my heart. I just wish it was easy. <laughs> I wish it was simple. Lord, put me to sleep like a good surgeon. Give me all the pain meds that I need and make this painless and make it quick so that I will, like Zach prayed, I'll, I'll love my wife better and I'll lead my kids better. But uh, it doesn't always work like that. Uh, open your Bible, please, to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. I love the Psalms. And I am on a, uh, a track of reading through the Psalms every month um, and other, other, you know, portions of the Bible, of course. But just getting up, try to get up in the morning, get out and walk and, and, and walk somewhere where I don't have to worry about crossing an intersection, either at the wetlands down in Huntington or on the beach and just read while I'm walking. And uh, one of the Psalms that uh, grabbed my attention a long time ago was Psalm 46. It might be where we got the, the name for our church, Refuge, because it's, it's in here. Um, you know, it's, it's throughout, you know, it's throughout the Psalms over and over again. But uh, um, it's, it's in here at the beginning, and I, I, I love just what it says. Uh, I want to read um, the whole thing to you, and then we'll look at a couple of other Psalms as well. It says that it's a song from the sons of Korah. If you know anything about the, the sons of Korah, Anybody know their father's name? Korah. Uh, turn to somebody and say, that was, a, that was an easy question. Korah. The sons of Korah, their dad is Korah. <laughs> and he was not a high point in the history of Israel. But the beautiful thing about the songs from the sons of Korah is that they overcame, they distanced themselves. There, there's some distance that's good. And they distanced themselves from the testimony of their father who came down really, really hard, and they wrote beautiful music. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Does that sound like a crisis to anybody but me? With mountains moving and nations falling, and though the earth gives way? He says this, there's the crisis. There's the change. How many of you realize we've been living in a crisis for a year? This is nothing new. Every preacher's preached about it, and uh, we all have been feeling it. In verse 4, though, here's our anchor. But there is a river. In the midst of the crisis, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Can I see the hands of the city of God? That's you. You're his people. His city is not his place. His city is his people. The church is not a place. The church is his people. And he said, there's a river in the midst of crisis. It doesn't say that helps a city of God just squeak by. It says it makes glad the people of God, the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. That's our anchor. And she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. And the nations rage. They do. The kingdoms totter. We've been watching that. He utters his voice, the earth melts. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I have had, I guess, an unresolved question throughout this whole year. I wonder how much of what we've been going through, not just as a nation, but as a planet, because this thing has spread around the world. And by the way, this thing is not just COVID. The other uh, accompanying crises have spread around the world. And I just have, uh, an un I guess it's still an unanswered question in, in totality, but how much of this has God been behind doing the shaking that needed to be done to change our perspective on everything, on everything, even about church? What is church? And um, So I'm going to let that hover in your heart like it's been hovering in mine for a year. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And now here, here's the new thing. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. He deals with our enemies in ways that we cannot. He just does. The things that threaten us, he, he deals with them. So here to me is the sweet spot of this psalm. So the son of Korah uh, says this. He says, so be still, voicing God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So, so he, he just says, to, especially to the people of God that are worried about what's been shaking around, just be still. I'll still be exalted. This hasn't ruined my plan, God would say to us. He still is sovereign. He's still in charge. He can make a beautiful, beautiful thing out of a mess, right? How many of you have heard the phrase recently, he takes a mess and creates a message, right? In your life and my life. I, I love that. I don't, I don't want to repeat that like it's mine, but it's true. He can take the messes that we've walked through. He can take the messes that we've made, and he can do something marvelous with that. He can restore if we'll let him restore, he can dig down deep into all of that stuff if we let him do that. So 2020, and I am so honored to be the first uh, uh, men's breakfast speaker here in 2021. Is this 20? This is 2021, right? It, it's not 2020 the sequel, right? Although it, it still feels pretty much like 2020 did. How many of you thought, oh, things are just going to be better on January 1st? We think that every year, and it's never true. But... Um, 2020 has uh, been the year of the perfect storm with COVID and the worldwide revolt that we've seen and the, uh, the election that would not stop. It just kept going on and on, the economic meltdown. And you know what that does to people? We, we like things, you know, and I love adventure. I love going and doing new things, but I always like knowing I can go back to where everything's stable. It's just like I left it. And it hasn't been that way. Times like this are disorienting. Has anybody, how many of you have had either yourself or somebody in your family that you can tell they're just, there's anxiety there. It's, it's disorienting. It's, it's these unforeseen changes. But stop using the word unprecedented because it's not unprecedented. This stuff has happened down through human history. Unprecedented in maybe our generation. But the, I saw a great little meme the other day of uh, how, how many of you know uh, I'm sure you've all seen the movie The Princess Bride, right? And Vizzini, and who's the other guy? I can't remember who he is, but uh, it's over the word inconceivable, yeah. inconceivable. And he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And it, it, and it said, uh, unprecedented. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. But it's unprecedented maybe for us. But change in crisis is unsettling, and it brings on anxiety and it brings on stress and to some depression, and some have given up in this year. And, some, and I know that we've all known people in our circle of, of, of friends or acquaintances or old school buddies. You heard he took his life. He got that bad. Other people have quit in different ways, and they've just checked out, and some have run back to what they had before. But it's been a year of crisis. Now, we had another crisis in our family this year. Uh, we have four children. And uh, all of them, all of them boys, except for the three girls. I, I say that every time. I say that every time. But they're wonderful kids. But the, uh, the fourth one is 34 right now and had been dating this young man for about nine years. 
And so I sat down with him one day for lunch and I said, Cooper, what are your intentions with my daughter? <laughs> at like the eight year mark. And, he's, and he's, he did what you're doing. He laughed at me. He said, I wondered if you'd ever ask me that. And so we had a great conversation. And about a year later on Christmas Eve, he asked her to marry him. And, um, and she said yes. And so that was Christmas Eve of last year. No, not last year, the year before, 2019. And so they planned the wedding for the end of June of 2020. And there's another crisis right there. That's another crisis. My baby daughter getting married. And what an unnatural thing for uh, a young man to come to a man with a daughter and say, can I have your daughter? I mean, you just everything in you wants to say, no, you can't have my daughter. And you can leave right now and never show your face again. But, but uh, he, he married her on June 27th. It was a COVID wedding. I did not do the wedding. It was in a backyard down in San Juan Capistrano. And it was a beautiful setting, the, the home that he grew up in down there out in the horse country. It was really, really, really pretty. And my, my daughter told me at one point, she, I took her to our last daddy-daughter dinner together before she got married. And, uh, and she said, about halfway through the meal, she said, well, Dad, we have an officiant. And that's, that's kind of a, what, uh, uh, Jack, a, a secular word for we got someone to do the wedding. I said, oh, an officiant. She said, well, you've met him. He's a friend of ours from school. I said, so was he ordained or where did he get his? She said, oh, on the internet. And so a lot of people are doing that. And, uh, and so, you know, I walked her down that the longest walk any man ever takes is to give his daughter away. Absolutely. Longest walk ever. And I slow, I slowed us down going down that, that sloping lawn and I'm holding, she's, she's holding my arm, I'm holding her hand and our fingers are entwined and I'm trying to keep from crying and, um, and so we got down there and the music stops and there's Cooper and there's the preacher, not preacher, officiant. He's standing right there and, and um, music stops. And at this point, the preacher says, who brings this woman to be married to this man? But not this guy. <laughs> he, he stood there and he said, am I supposed to say something now? <laughs> Yeah, kind of, but I, I didn't say anything, and uh, everybody laughed a little bit, and, uh, and Starlin, I, I kissed her, and then um, she said, oh, Dad, I'm sorry, you didn't get to answer the question, and so I knew I had a, a moment in the, the reception where I was asked by my daughter, would you like to do a speech at the, at the, uh, at the reception, <laughs> and I, I subdued my joy at that because now I've got their attention. But, um, but I said, yeah. So I got up, and the first thing that I said was, well, in answer to the unasked question a little bit earlier, her mother and I give her to be married to Cooper, and, and with, with great joy as well. But um, there'd been a lot of stress in that time for all of us, especially of us in church world. Uh, will we be able to get back inside again? That happened, began to happen for many in May. And, uh, and we began to meet inside, socially distant, wearing our masks and all that. And, uh, but then came, and you remember this, I'm sure. Then came the edict from Governor <clears throat> that, um, that <laughs> we were not allowed to sing. Do you remember this? No singing, no chanting. Anybody remember the other thing in that edict? No singing, no chanting, no kissing religious articles. We didn't have any trouble with the kissing religious articles, but I turned to our congregation and I said, this is what our governor Newsom has told us we can't do, but we have a mandate in scripture to sing, and we're gonna sing. We don't have a mandate in scripture to meet on Sunday mornings at nine and 11 a.m. We'll meet in other ways, and we, we kept that for a long time, and, and then we started meeting outside in our parking lot. But I said, we have a command in scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, to lift our voices and sing. And so what I did is I wore my mask. I said, well, let's wear the masks. Okay, we'll wear the mask. And I had the mask up over my nose for four services that weekend. And I could feel it in my chest. Just, uh, I'm breathing my own exhaust. And you know how that goes. And I just, it was hard to breathe. That was Sunday. Monday morning, I was rushed to ER. And uh, it wasn't COVID. Uh, but it turned out to be an atrial flutter which is different than an atrial fibrillation. 
they're both an arrhythmia kind of a thing. My heart rate went up close to 200. And I drove home and I said, honey, you need to drive me to ER. We better get this checked. And so they kept me overnight and they said, yeah, you've got an atrial flutter. Here, here's the difference from what I understand. Atrial fibrillation, they're both erratic heartbeats. Atrial fibrillation is, is kind of an uneven erratic heartbeat as it, as it moves. And atrial flutter is a steady heartbeat, but it's still really elevated. So atrial fibrillation is like a jazz beat. Flutter is like a country western beat, I guess. But it's just speed. It's, da it's a dance beat. It gets moving. And, and so there I was in, in the hospital and thinking, look, I, what's, what is going on here? And so I, I got out the, the next day, had an amazing opportunity to witness to a guy who might not even be alive today. This was back in, in, um, in July, July 6th. But I, I knew that something had changed in my life. And what had changed is what I just talked to you about earlier. When I had visited, uh, some of you might know uh, Dave Sylvester. You know Dave Sylvester over in York, England. Wonderful brother. Stayed with him for a while and um, on, on some, some ministry stuff over there. And uh, I, I'd hear the door open in his house like at 4.30 or 5 in the morning and Dave would go out. He'd come back about 8 o'clock in the morning and I asked him, where, where are you going, Dave, that early in the morning? He said, well, I, I take my Bible and I go out and I walk. I walk around the flower fields and the farms out on the edges of York and, and I just read the word while I'm walking. And uh, he said, just, it's just my, my time with the Lord in the morning. And uh, I said, hey, can I go with you tomorrow? He said, well, you can go with me but I'm not walking with you. He said, I go out to walk with the Lord. I'm not, I'm not walking with you, but we'll go out and you go one way and I'll go the other way. And that set a pattern for me for a number of years. I came back living in Fountain Valley and I'd get up early in the morning. I'd take my Bible and I'd throw on my shorts and flip flops, go across the street to Mile Square Park and I'd, I'd walk around in, in, the, in the grass, take my flip flops off and just walk in the wet grass and, and just read God's word and maybe sing a little bit and pray. And it was just so healthy for me in more ways than one. It just really was to be with the Lord in the morning for me. And I'm not going to dictate to anybody that it has to be the morning, but get your eyes on the scroll. Get your eyes off the scrolling for a while and get your eyes on the scrolls of God, the word of God. It doesn't matter what pace you're going. Get his word into your heart. Give him your attention. He's speaking to you every time you open the book. He speaks to your heart too. His spirit's with you. But I'd done that for years. And then I looked at myself in the mirror one day and I said, dude, you need to get in shape. And so I'd go out in the morning and I'd put my headphones on and I'd listen to the word while I was pushing it. Instead of a stroll with the Lord, a stroll with a scroll. I kind of like that. I hadn't thought about that. A stroll with a scroll, it became a jam, just, you know, a, a cardio. And you know what happened? And I'll, I'll make this really brief. The cardio edged out the devo. I was still in the Bible. I was still listening to, to sermons. Now, if I'm preaching through a passage, uh, and, and I would, I'd look up a Jacobelan message and see how he approached the passage. And so I'm in the Word, but it wasn't the same as just reading God's Word to feed my soul. And the cardio, it just edged out the devil. I want to encourage you, brothers, don't let that happen. I, I made a promise to myself a number of years ago that the first person I would speak to every morning would be the Lord. I'd just say, good morning, Lord. Thank you for the day. I'm yours. Let's go. <laughs> Something brief like that. And then the next person would be my wife. If she was still home, she might have been off to a prayer meeting or the ladies' Bible study. And then the last person I'd speak to every night would be the Lord. And, and the, the last words that I would read every night would be his words. And the first words I'd read in the morning would be his words. But find a way to keep your eyes fixed on the text. And I think it'll, the effect of it is going to be exactly what the end of Psalm 46 calls for. Be still, just calm down, I'm still in charge. I can handle this, and he can handle this, amen? So the first day that I got back onto my, my walk with the Lord in the morning with the scroll, um, I decided I'm gonna read through the Psalms. This is, this is July, and it's the 13th, and I have this pattern, I read five Psalms a day, that, that correspond with each day of the, of the month. So the first day of the month, of every month, I read Psalm 1 through 5, second day 6 through 10. And, that, and I mark this little, you might see this as I flip through. You'll see, uh, uh, no, they're not showing up there. 
but, uh, but I, I put it right up in the corner where I'm supposed to start that morning. So I don't have to do the math early in the morning. I'm not a math person. And, and the very first day I was in Psalm 61 through 65. I want to read you just some little, some of the beginning statements in 61 through 65. Because here I am, I was exhausted. And I was distracted. And I was anxious. And maybe some of it had to do with giving away my last daughter and just praying that God would do a fresh work and bring her and Cooper really, really close to him, do a work of restoration there. And I'd let all of that stress get down, get its, its roots down into my tentacles, is probably a better word, down into my soul. And so I started in Psalm 61, and the very first thing that I read, <laughs> now remember, a week before I'd been in the hospital with a heart event, was this. Hear my cry, O God, Psalm 61, 1. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will call to you when my heart is faint. But, oh, Lord, that's cute. That's really cute. Yeah, here I am just overcoming this heart thing and when my heart is faint. Oh, that's cool. I love it when you speak to me like that, Lord. That's, that's neat, and I, I marked it. I was in Huntington Beach, which is the ends of the earth, by the way. By definition, there's nothing but an ocean beyond this. So from the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. And that's exactly what I was doing. Psalm 62, the first one. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. I just heard the Lord speaking to me. I want you to be still, Bill. I, 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 you could put it this way. Chill, Bill. Just be still and trust me. For God alone my soul waits, and from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. And yours too, brothers. He's your fortress. And David said here, I shall not be greatly shaken. Shall not be. Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. And here I am early in the morning. It's 6 o'clock in the morning in the summer. I'm out walking. The sunshine's just coming up. And the Lord just knew where I would be. I love the fact that he knew what day to get me back into his word so that it would correspond with all of these, these powerful statements to my heart. So David says, God, you're my God. I'm going to get up early and seek you. I'm going to come after you. My soul is thirsty for you. Oh, my, th my soul was. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. So he says, so I've come to the sanctuary. And I, I was just, oh, I, I tell you, I, the joy was beginning to just pour back into my parched soul on, on July 13th, 2020. 64 says this, hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Well, I did have some complaints. How many of you know God loves to hear your complaints too? He said, bring them to me. Bring me your problems. Bring me your gripes. Bring them to me. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from the dread of the enemy and hide me from the secret plots of the wicked or the wicked one. Man, this was just, it was energizing my soul. Then the last one, check this out, Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayers. I, I love that, that David said, God, I know this about you. You listen to me. You, and when nobody else is listening, when nobody else has time, Hey, you're, you're, maybe you're sitting there with your wife and she's doing something. She's got a project going. I don't know if your wife knits or crochets or does crafting, craft type stuff, but, but you know, you're talking to her and you, and you know she didn't hear a word you just said. And you pause and, and, and then she's, she does <clears throat> what you do sometimes. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> but she, you weren't listening. But God's hearing you. He hears prayers, and I love that David recognized that. Oh, Lord, you hear my prayer. To you shall all flesh come when iniquities prevail against me. You atone for my transgression. God, when I get stuck, you know, when I stumble, I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands because every hand in the place would be up. But if, if I said, how many times this year have you, have you stumbled, or last year, how many times last year could you look and, and say, oh, I, I could have done that better and that better and I shouldn't have done that and why did I say that? And I had you put up fingers that correspond with how many times you stumbled. We'd run out of fingers, wouldn't we? We all stumble in many ways, Scripture says, one of the apostles. But then listen to this. Blessed is the one, and this was the, the closing of this almost in Psalm 65 that day. 
The Lord's speaking to my heart, David saying this, oh, blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. Blessed is the one that, Lord, you say, hey, Bill, would you just get back here with me? Would you walk with me, Bill? I, Bill, I'd love to walk with you in the mornings. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, David says, the holiness of your temple. Then I jump over to verse nine. This is the last one. You visit the earth and you water it. You greatly enrich it. And I've got this one underlined, notated, back to Psalm 46 about the river that makes glad the city of our God. Listen to this. And I want to say this to all of you, and not just especially to young people, but to all of us. You, you'll, hit a, you'll hit a place in life, maybe you already have, maybe you're in it now, where you're just going to feel dry. There's probably no other, there's no better way to say it, parched, a parched soul. You just feel dry. You remember how you used to be? Was it David, it was David the psalmist that said, we used to go with the throngs to the house of God. And he said, I'm going back there again. But you're going to be parched. You're going to be dry. You need to know this. You need to underline it. I underlined it. I highlighted it and notated it in the margin of this little um, psalm that I carry with me. It says, the river of God is full of water. The river of God is full of water. That's, that's the Lord saying, I've got more than enough for your, for, for your thirst i got more than enough to restore you from this parched place. Some of you might be able to look back and remember a day, maybe when you first came to Christ right here. I was talking to, to, to Josh in the back just a little bit. He said, this is where he came to Christ. And maybe you can look back to when you first became a follower of Jesus and how full of joy you were. You were anything but dry. You were those, uh, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. We'd sing that back in the tent days down at Costa Mesa. <laughs> There'd be this one moment where, and it's silly, but everyone goes splish, splash, splish, splash. It was like a, like a, a, a kindergarten you know, song exercise. But there was so much joy. Let me tell you, brothers, the river of God is full of water. And there's nothing else that's going to quench your soul except the Lord himself, his word, his spirit, and you and I walking in the course of his life that he's, that he's called us to. He has something he wants you to do, that he's assigned you to do. Now, I, I do believe if, if I don't do what he wants me to do, he'll find someone else to do it. I really believe God in his sovereignty. He'll get it done. He'll send somebody else to love that person who's in the middle of my road if I choose to walk around them. Or if I'm the second guy that chooses to walk around them. He'll send a Samaritan to stop for the person who's in the middle of the road. But th there's more than enough water in the river of God to refresh you and to keep you. And if you don't keep yourself refreshed, if you don't keep yourself full by, I'm not going to say force feeding yourself, but making yourself eat of the word and to drink of his spirit, you're going to be parched, brothers. You just will. I... Um, Jack and I were talking earlier about our hopeful trips to Israel. <laughs> and we're going to get back there. We're definitely going to get back there. We've both been there about the same amount of times, about 20 times. And, but this last time, I don't know if you've ever been down in this one spot, Jack. This is How many of you guys have been to Israel? Okay, how many of you haven't been to Israel, but you really want to go to Israel? <clears throat> there you are. Keep your hands up. We're going to sign you up for the next trip right now. <clears throat> but I was there on a hiking tour back in, in March. We left on, on uh, March 9th. <laughs> we were the second to the last um, flight of, of tourists that they allowed to land, and they cut us off after the one that came in after us. We were on a hiking tour, so we went up into uh, Galilee first, and we weren't in the typical um, you know, tourist centers, and so we were kind of off the radar because they were rounding up people that were there and telling them it's time to go home right now. This COVID thing is real. Go home. So we stayed beyond the radar, and we were getting ready to go down to Elat and down into the, the, all, all of the sites along the Dead Sea, <clears throat> and they were all closing down. There was a, uh, <clears throat> a locust swarm that came in near Elat. There was a, a fierce uh, sandstorm that came in, and we couldn't go there anyway, even if it wasn't COVID. But they shut down the West Bank, and our, our, our tour organizer was telling us, you might want to go home. Maybe we should take you to the airport. And I said, no, let's see if, if we can find a way. Can you get us into a hotel that's empty now? 
And so he got us into a hotel in Jerusalem, Christ Church Hotel, uh, our guest house, which is right inside one of the old ancient gates, the Jaffa Gate. <clears throat> and he said, okay, we're going to put all 25 of you there, but we can't give you the bus, we can't let you have the driver, and you can't have your guide. I said, all right. You know, in my heart, I'm thinking, yay, I get to lead this thing the way I want to lead it. I don't know if you've ever been there, but sometimes a guide has their idea what they want you to do and what they think about this site. So one other pastor and a guy who'd been there a number of times, we broke it up into groups of eight, eight, and nine. And, and we did our hiking tour around Israel, uh, around Jerusalem. Four nights instead of one night in Jerusalem. It was marvelous. But we went on this one place. You go down to what's called the City of David, where his palace would have been. They, they're, they're more than relatively sure. And uh, so when we're down there, we always talk about David and what was her name? What was her name? Well, yeah, Bathsheba was her name. And how David was up on the rooftop one night when he should have been out at the battle. You know the story. You know what? The, the only description you get about Bathsheba is she was very beautiful. Very beautiful. And a neighbor of David. So I wonder how many times David had walked his housetop to look towards Bathsheba. It never indicts Bathsheba on anything. Just She was only guilty of being very, very beautiful. And David couldn't say no. So David stands above the valley, looks down, and he sees her bathing, and he says, I just have to have that. That was a purposeful pause. <laughs> How many times have we said that to ourselves? I have to have it. I know I shouldn't, but I have to have that. I have to go there. I have to go there. And if you find yourself at a place like this, like Moses, when he's in, in, in Egypt, and he's going to deliver the people of God, and he sees an Egyptian beating up or killing, be, well, beating up, beating um, a Jewish slave, he does this. The Bible says he looked this way and he looked that way. If you find yourself looking this way and that way to see if the coast is clear, stop in your tracks, brothers. And David looked and he saw her and he took her. And, you know, the next 10 chapters are horrific fallout from that. Sobering fallout. And I remember giving that message feeling like, man, I think we really hit that there. Oh, that was good. Then I saw people, we've never been this way, I saw people walking down the steps from the city of David down into the Kidron Valley. And they were walking up a trail. I never noticed people doing that before. So I thought, let's go do that. And we'll walk up to the Garden of Gethsemane from there. So we did. We're, we're walking along and we're talking a little bit about this and that. And we get halfway between the city of David, the precipice from which Jesus, not Jesus, but David fell. And we're halfway between there and, and the, the Temple Mount, the precipice on the Temple Mount, where Satan brought Jesus. And he stood him up on, on, on the corner of that wall, looking down in the Kidron Valley. He said, you should just jump, because the Bible says he'll give his angels charge over you. And what did Jesus say? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So Jesus, on his precipice, he stood firm. And David on his precipice, he did a swan dive into the valley and into sin that cost him so much more. You've heard this before. Sin will always cost you more than you're willing to pay. It'll take you further than you wanted to go. It'll hold you longer than you wanted to stay. It just will. It just will. It has its, it has its tentacles. But I stood there between those two and I realized where we were standing, the perfect visual on what will you do when you're at your, on your next precipice of temptation. You're going to swan dive like David or stand firm like Jesus. Jesus showed us how to stand. There's no indication that, that David thought, oh, wait a minute, what did I write in that beautiful psalm that, Lord, I'm always going to be faithful to you? What did I read in the Bible? What did I read in, 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 you know, in the Torah about the ways of a godly man of God, it just didn't come to his mind, or if it did, he dismissed it. He said, she's pretty, and I've got to have her. And I, I stood there trying to talk, but the emotions overcame me. And uh, I stood there with those 25 people and just weeping over 
What, what, I, what God was putting before me, Bill, what will you do when you're at your next precipice? Where will you stand? How much are you willing to pay just because she's so beautiful or because it's so tempting and I'd make so much money if I just didn't tell the whole truth? And so it, I'll tell you, guys, it, it just really shook me. And, I, and I, I look back to thinking how dry I was last June, right up to, to July the 13th. And the Lord said, Bill, I would love to walk with you. Come take a walk with me and let me go deeper. And he wants to go deeper with every single one of us. You think about the river and how can you not think about Jesus saying, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And he who drinks, what's going to happen? Out of you will flow a river, a river. Everybody say river. river. Not a trickle, but a river. All I know about a river, I don't know a whole lot about rivers, but a river is way more water than I personally need for anything. And that's the point. If I come to him and drink, my thirst will be quenched and I'll be resaturated and I'll be drenched because he promised. He said, your thirst will be quenched. He said, then out of you will come a river of living water. What would that be for? Well, maybe the next person who's in the middle of my road, which I know who that will be after I leave here. That will be my bride joy. She's in the middle of my road every day. I'm not saying she's in my way every day. She's in the middle of my road every day, and I get to throw my arms around her and drench her with the river that comes from me like she drenches me with the river that comes from her. And I want to guard that with everything that is in me. So stay drenched, my brothers. Stay there. There, there, is, there is no reason to be dry. There's no reason if you are dry to stay dry. Get resaturated in his word and taking a walk with him. The Psalms are, are full of, and I've been noticing it as I was going through here, they're full of the word refuge, but they're full of the water metaphors about the sea and the rollers coming in and the crashing of the waves and the faithfulness of God in all of that, in, in, in every, every single step of my life and your life too. They, um, oh, there's this other one. Um, we used to sing this down at the tent too. If you know it, sing it with me. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine, for oil and for the young, for the young of the flock and of the herd. Listen, and their soul shall be as a watered garden. And they shall not sorrow any more at all. There's no need to be dry when you can be drenched. Um, COVID may have changed so much for us and stressed us and made us anxious. It changed so much around the world, but it hasn't changed anything about our mandate to draw near to God, to love God, and then go love people. Just go love people. The cornerstone, the, the centerpiece of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is not what we're doing right now. This is very, very important. But the centerpiece of what it means to be a lover of God and a follower of Jesus is to love God and love people. And if our gatherings give us opportunities to do that, praise God, of course they do. Don't let a brother who needs encouragement to get out of here and, and until you have an opportunity to greet him, bless him, and just pray for him, maybe. But it's not, it's not the core thing. You, you hear so many people, you, you got a conversation going with somebody, and you, it's somebody you, you, you're just meeting. And, and I had one of these down at the beach the other day. I saw a guy, and he's sitting in a chair, and he's fishing, and it's high tide, and the water's coming up over you know, the berm and, and on in, into the, the, the dry sand, which a few months ago we weren't allowed to walk on, right? I guess we could walk in the dry sand, whatever it was. But suddenly a big wave comes in. He's sitting in his chair. It crashed on that little sand cliff and just drenched him. And I thought, oh, man, this guy's going to probably get up cussing. He turned around. He laughed. He said, I guess high tide's not over with yet. My first clue, I wonder if he's a believer. So I walk this way, he kept fishing, I come back, his chair is empty. I'm taking a picture. 
of his, his chair, his empty chair with a beautiful ocean behind it. And I, I want to put it somewhere as a reminder that God's saying, come and sit with me, Bill. Walk with me, but sit with me and listen. So he sees me, comes back, and we talk for 15, 20 minutes. And about at the 15-minute level, I'm thinking, this guy really might be a Christian because he hasn't dropped the F-bomb or any other bomb in 15 minutes. <laughs> his language is clean. And it turns out he was a brother. And five years ago, his wife tragically... Um, unexpectedly just died with, with no warning whatsoever. He said, Bill, I went into a really hard four years blaming God and walked away and, and uh, I dove into alcohol. And he, he said, yeah, that really helped. And, and he said, I came back about 14 months ago and God is so good. And, and I said, hey, Dale, I'm going to pray for you. And if you got a prayer for me, I could use a prayer from you too right now. And so we stood there on the sand and just... We just prayed for one another, and um, and I forget what I was going to say. Oh, we, we were just talking about this thing that, you know, the opportunities we have to, to touch somebody in Jesus' name, it happens outside of here, so let's keep it going. Amen? A great reminder, the church has never, ever been shut down. <laughs> Not the real church. Our buildings were, yeah. But the church is, is alive and well, and I believe... That, um, that God is still in the business of, of chasing us down. And this, I want to sing this last song, and I'll be done before 9.30. How about that? I don't know if this has ever happened for me, Jack. But um, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's another song that I, I, I wrote probably a year and a half ago, um, and I call it The Hound of Heaven. How many of you have ever read the poem, The Hound of Heaven? If you haven't read it, you should go read it. It's a little bit thick in, in the language, it was um, translated from the French, I, I think it was French, but anyway, it was written over 100 years ago, so it's more like thick poetic language, but it is worth getting through it. And the hound of heaven is God who's chasing down the sinner and the broken person with no intent except to love them and to restore them. And um, I, I tell you, brothers, I know that it's absolutely true. Maybe there's a, a brother in here this morning that you haven't surrendered your life yet to Jesus, and the hound of heaven has come after you today because you're sitting there dry like the rest of us, and Jesus says, I want to give you living water, and you'll never, never thirst again. I want to fill you to overflowing so your life can be a witness to other people, and you'll be a, you'll be a mission of your own. You'll be a raging missionary into a world full of broken people, confused people, coveted people, and every other nasty thing that's going on right now. You'll be a strength that people might even say, hey, whatever you got, bro, I want it. I want it. So this is, this is really my, my testimony song. I got saved uh, 50 years ago, uh, last November 9th. Um, and uh, there's some imagery in this song that kind of harkens back to, to where I was in the summer of 1970 as a very angry, grieving, um, uh, worn-out hippie. <laughs> And, uh, and Jesus came tracking me down. One morning, uh, my friends and I had hitchhiked into Yosemite Valley. And um, we could hear, we probably got in there about 10 o'clock at night, and you could hear the falls before you could see it. And then as we were walking through camp, I can't remember which one it was. It was the hiker camp, the hippie camp. Looking for some hippies that would let us, you know, camp in their campsite, uh, breaking the trees, and you could see the falls. And I thought, I'm going up there tomorrow morning. I said to Paul and Mark the next morning, I said, let's go. Let's go to the top of the falls. He said, no, we don't want to go. So I found myself on the trail up to the top all by myself, which was okay. I, I, I like being alone. And I got to the, the place where you're right on the ledge, right by the falls, and there's a railing. And I, there was this voice in my head, deeper than my head, down in, in my heart and my soul, just saying, get it over with. Why not die here? What a beautiful place to die. And I was standing there white-knuckling that railing and fighting back an urge to just step over the edge and die in Yosemite. But the hound of heaven was after me. I want you to hear this. High above the valley Fighting for my breath My empty heart is pounding an echo of my steps Running like a fugitive With all 
I have left from the hound of heaven His voice will not be censored In the pounding of the falls And it's racing down the canyon Crashing off the walls And I can't outrace his whisper But I must outrun this call From the hound of heaven And I've cursed him to his face And I have raised my fist Oh, I have laid the blame on him For all that I have missed And I've turned my back to run But he won't give up his quest And yet after all I've said and done Somehow I have been kissed By the hound of heaven Now here I lay in ruins Just like old Jericho All of my defenses crumble And I've got no place left to go I'm too stubborn to surrender Too afraid to face my foe This hound of heaven Cursed him to his face and I have raised my fist Oh, I have laid the blame on him For all that I have missed Oh, I've turned my back to run But he won't give up this quest So after all I've said and done Oh, how could I be kissed By the hound of heaven And I feel his breath upon me It's like fire from the skies It's burning through my bitterness And breaking ancient lies But just one word of freedom And he rolls my stone aside Now wounded hands are lifting me And love is in his eyes Is this the hound of heaven? But after all I've said and done Oh, why should I be kissed By the hound of heaven? Oh, after all I've said and done Why should I be loved By the hound of heaven? Father, we thank you that you pursue your beloved, Lord. You pursue those that you love, Lord. When we are so unlovely, when we've proven our rebellion, we've practiced our rebellion, Lord, and run from you, when we've hidden our sin, Lord God, and yet pursued what's not ours, what would ruin us like it ruined David, Lord God. Father, I pray for my brothers here in Morning Star. Pastor Jack and the leaders here, Father God, all of us just men with feet of clay. So easily, Lord, we could take the same dive that, that David did. But God, help us to stand like Jesus did with your word in our hearts and your word on our lips, Lord, in these days. Help us to stand firm, living by your word and your word alone, Lord, and honoring you. Father, I just pray for my brothers and guys here today that need to surrender to you and give it all to you, Lord. Leave it all in your capable and strong hands. Just pray for your outpouring upon this fellowship here, Lord, that it would just result in such a revival up here in La Mirada, Whittier, La Habra, Lord, and just flow all over this state and all over this world, Father. Send these men out today, Father, with your power, with your spirit, to do what you put in their path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, grace and peace to you guys. Bless you, men of Morningstar. Let's go get it done. Amen. Amen, amen Jack.